Fantastic. Yeah. So welcome everybody. I guess we're just about one minute to five, which is great. Um, hope everybody's well and uh, delighted to, to see you all here. Uh, my name's Simon Campbell. And I'm joined already with Antonio Della Anna of Fineco Bank. And just in a few moments time, Adam Harris will be joining us as well. He's going to be our main presenter uh, for the evening. Uh, I'm the warm up act, if you like, and uh, I'm just here to put things in place for us because we are tonight doing a live part three of a four part series of webinars that we're producing in association with Adam Harris and Finneco Bank. And uh, if you've missed part one or two, and this is the first time you're um, attending, um, don't worry because the recordings are available on the FNECO website, of course. But uh, as well as that, um, we will go over some of the principles that we covered um, in the past few weeks. We'll have a quick recap of them and you can ask some questions before we get started tonight. Tonight's uh, feature is going to be fundamental analysis. So we're going to be looking at um, how you go about analysing a market uh, a company a share price using fundamental information, which is uh, forward looking, ideally using past financial data and uh, historic information, but trying to build a picture of the, the, the future price, the future valuation uh, of a company. Uh, we're not going to be looking so much at the chart, the price behavior of the chart that is uh, sometimes sort of lagging, um, although it does introduce you to the idea of trends and the probability of trends. Uh, we covered that in the last session, uh, if you want to go back and look at that. Uh, but tonight's going to be all about fundamental analysis. So hope you're all well. Hope you can all hear me okay. Um, give me a little yes, hello, um, if you are hearing and seeing me okay uh, in the, uh, the chat box, which we have. If you use the menu just at the top of your screen, there's also uh, a questions box as well. So either the chat or the questions box. So let's get started. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes to put you in the, the picture. Um, who am I? Uh, Simon Campbell, round the clock trader um, is probably what a lot of you will know me for. Um, here's Adam just logging in now, which is great. Um, I've run round the clock trader, the, the webinar financial education company for about seven years now. And um, that is mainly shorter term trading and active trading, CFDs, all that sort of, um, <clears throat> I would say day trading, but we also do short to medium term trading. So I've switched my thing off. And we've also been running London Investment Week, another brand which looks at um, more uh, investment oriented for the medium to long term uh, stock investing. I also run the IX Investor Show, which I haven't run physically for the last few years, but I am relaunching it this year at the end of November in London. It's a physical face-to-face -face show um, because we're also fed up with Zoom calls and uh, webinars due to the pandemic. Um, probably guessed by my accent, uh, born and raised in Scotland, uh, initial sort of five years working at Royal Bank of Scotland before I uh, sort of tripped into running a financial education company with my sister, in fact. Uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, this is what sort of gave birth to this whole industry, this career of mine. And I've gone on to run several businesses in the sort of financial education sphere. Um, IX Media being the current business of which I run these various brands under with and which Fineco are a client. Uh, so delighted to work with them on all this education. I'm an associate of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, a bit of a mouthful. Um, I did this for a previous role about seven or eight years ago for the company where I acted as a sort of compliance officer and money laundering officer and various uh, sort of CEO roles and things like that. I, largely regulatory. Um, it taught me a lot about the, the markets, the risk side of, of investment in the markets. Didn't really teach me too much about stock picking and uh, stock selection strategies. So uh, that's what we're going to cover tonight. Um, but it was a, a worthwhile um, exam to do. Somebody asked me after the last session, said, oh, is that a great exam to do? Simon, does it really help you to 
uh, you know, to become a good investor? The answer is not really. Um, it will help you open doors if you're looking for careers in the city, um, in the financial city. But as a private investor, not really going to give you the tools uh, that you need. So moving on, our main presenter tonight is going to be Adam Harris. He's a trader, a fund manager, a mentor, or a coach, amongst other things. Um, I've known Adam for about five years now. He's an excellent speaker, very accomplished, full-time trader himself. Um, does sort of short, medium to longer term fund management. He actually manages other people's money in a professional fund. Um, so he's very well qualified to, to speak to us tonight. Uh, and I think you'll find him uh, very interesting and entertaining to listen to as well. So Adam Harris, the other person that you can see on your screen. Uh, and again, Antonio, forgive me, I haven't updated the photo. This is when you were clean shaven. Um, this is uh, Antonio Delana, Head of Business Development at Fineco Bank, uh, speaking to us live from Milan, where Fineco are headquartered. Uh, now, if you haven't come across Fineco, they're one of the fastest growing sort of fintech uh, banks. Um, they've been in Milan, in Italy for many years, uh, I think almost 20 years, if I'm, if I'm right, even more, uh, more recently in the UK for about the last four or five years but growing very, very quickly indeed. Uh, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit of the platform later on. Adam's going to be using the platform during the presentation. Lots of great features all on one platform for your current account, your investment account, your funds, and also your trading, your CFDs, your Forex, all there and all very usable. So great features there. So thank you to Antonio for being uh, with us live tonight. Just a short uh, compliance with my compliance hat on. Uh, presentations regarding it's an educational event tonight. Um, we just want you to, to be clear that we're not going to be, we might be talking about stocks, we might be talking about some shares, but we're not um, recommending you buy anything or sell anything um, or make any decisions based on what we're talking about tonight. So this is purely uh, for educational purposes uh, alone. And if you're in any doubt about um, what to do, consult a professional financial advisor. Um, so that's something we just have to. Uh, make sure that we're happy about that. What are we doing tonight? I'm just going to make sure I'm not uh, talking for too long because we've got a lot to get through and I want to, to get straight through to Adam as quickly as we can. Um, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about what we consider an intelligent investor to be. Um, we're going to look at some of the information sources for fundamental analysis, just trying to get an understanding of what fundamental analysis is. And if you are in in fact, let us know if, if anybody's on the, the call, if you could just let us know, do you use fundamentals when you go already? If, if you're already in the markets and you're already trading and investing, let us know, just put a sort of yes or no, if you use any of the information that we would consider fundamental analysis when you make a decision to, to, to trade or to, to buy or sell. Um, a stock. I mean, what, we're, what we're talking about here is effectively using all the, the different information that's available to us, financial information, economic data, uh, understanding the sector that a company is operating in, uh, any sort of outward factors that might affect the performance of that company, the sales of the product. All these things are all fundamental. That is a war breaking out, hurricane storms, these, all these things are, are real events um, that can that can affect uh, a company's performance and get taken into the mix when we're trying to uh, calculate sort of forward price earnings ratios, respective price earnings ratios and so forth. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail because again, this is Adam's area and uh, he's going to be telling us about uh, some of the, the more interesting ratios that he uses to, to sort of value the company and um, how we can make some analysis. It says there for Nickel Stock Screener as well. That's a tool that shouldn't be overlooked. It's part of the package that comes free with every account that Fineco opens. And it gives you access to a really fantastic tool with about 36, 37 preset filters for screening all the stocks in all the UK, the US and the European markets. So uh, you can set filters to bring out stocks with various characteristics. And it's even got preset uh, strategies in there. Um, one that I, I can show you later on is a sort of pandemic 
COVID-19 recovery stocks. So you can see a whole filter based on their financial information of all the stocks and the companies that are due to rebound fast out of this pandemic. So great stuff there. Uh, anyway, we'll get finished uh, ideally by about 6.15, 6.20, have some questions, uh, and hopefully we can round off by 6.30 at the latest. So I hope this is uh, okay for you so far. Um, let me start by asking what is an intelligent investor? Um, well, I would consider it really someone with a certain level of competency in building an investment portfolio. That's what we're doing here to become a competent investor. It's not just about buying one share and hoping that's the one that's going to go to the moon. Um, that sometimes happens, but very it doesn't. Uh, so what you want to do is to, is to be your own fund manager and you want to sort of build yourself a collection of, of stocks of investments that uh, will reduce your risk because if one should collapse, a disaster happens, uh, the other stocks are there and not all your eggs are in one basket for want of the better uh, phrase that's used. So you have to have the knowledge of the steps that are required to build a portfolio you also have to have some realistic expectations, um, which I think is is important always, even in short term trading and long term investing, uh, have an understanding of what you think will be realistic to achieve. A lot of that can depend on the starting capital, starting pot uh, as well, but there's lots of other factors that you know, take into account. Have a practical understanding of the working of financial markets and basic economics. Uh, yes. But do you need to be a financial professional? No. Um, it's very simple and very easy to learn the, the basics that, that you need to go. I think we're all uh, becoming taught about financial markets these days on the sort of 24 hour news. We can't help get away from GDP figures and latest employment figures out of the US and things like that. We're all being gradually taught about the connection between the fundamental data that's put out by the organizations and the institutes and how it affects share prices uh, so you don't need to be an expert by, by any stretch but you do need to have a, at least some interest and some uh, ability to grasp the the impact of of announcements on markets you need to be someone prepared to build wealth gradually over time put some work in again yes don't expect this to happen overnight it's uh, it's a it's it's a it's a longer term road it's a path of building wealth and compounding and, and reinvesting that's the way to to, to put a good uh, portfolio together over time you have to measure how much time you have of course as well uh, and that can often determine what uh, investment uh, what risk uh, risky level of investments you might want to to get involved in determining the time frames and the returns that you need um, and also considering which assets best fit the portfolio. It's not just stocks and shares, there's commodities, there's, there's fixed income, there's bonds, cryptocurrencies, even uh, property, fine art, jewelry, all sorts of different investments uh, that you can either invest directly in or you can invest through what are called ETFs, exchange traded funds, uh, and you'll find them on the Fineco platform as well. Uh, and you also need to be someone who understands that risk is involved, uh, and that's something you can never uh, escape completely from. This investing carries with it risk, um, but you can learn to manage it, and that's that's the important thing I think that we want to be uh, achieving. Fundamental analysis. Again, I'm going to go just touch on this because I know Adam's going to talk to you in more um, depth about this. As we get started, but as I said before, it, it's it's the two methods of an analyzing. What you're trying to do is 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 to try to look for a share, look look for a company. You may not even know what the company is or what it makes, um, and then you can look and you can see a chart, you can see a price going up. You think that's great, I'll buy it. But that that's technical analysis. All you're doing is looking at the price behavior. Um, and then making a decision based on the, the probability of, of a trend continuing, uh, a, a, a price behaving in a certain way into the future. Fundamental analysis takes into account the real data, the what actually is the company selling, 
Um, what is it making? How is is it? Is it a new company? Is it is it a new product that's just launched? A new invention, an Uber or a Tesla or something like that we haven't had before, or is it just a company that's maybe in the twilight of the industry? Uh, diesel cars, for example. You know, you know, there, there's different ways of analyzing these things, and you'll find that as you go on, you'll you'll see different investors characterize themselves as growth, value, or income. And if you are a growth investor, that means you are very much looking for the new startup company, the new on-scene invention, one that is set to grow very quickly. And uh, if you can buy into that company, if you can take a stake in that company uh, at an early stage, you will ride the, the performance up um, as, as it grows very quickly as a new start. Value investing uh, is something rather different. Value investing is, uh, for the main part, more established companies that are trading in the public market. Um, but for some reason or other, the price does not reflect the real value of, of the business. For some reason, the market has more or less normally temporarily priced the shares at a discount to the real value of the company. So you look at all the data and you think, well, this company should be trading at two pounds, but it's, but it's actually only asking for one pound fifty. There, that's a that's an opportunity to buy because normally, random theory suggests that the market will always return to the fair price. And so, if you can find another value share um, and do this through sort of forensic fundamental analysis, then you're going to make some profit when it returns to its fair price, the price and value become aligned again. Income investing, uh, again, uh, if you bring a portfolio together for retirement or you just want to sort of full-time investing uh, and making a living off these, these investments, you want to live for companies that reward the shareholders by giving them an annual cash dividend. Some of them are very generous, some of them are not so generous. Um, it's something what you can look at all the data again and uh, assess a company by how much dividends it's paid over the last three or five or 10 years. Uh, it's more information there. So we're going to be using financial ratios. Um, you've probably heard of price earnings ratio, the PE ratio. It's the it's a multiple um, of the, the price of the share over the, the earnings of the of the company. It gives you a very clear uh, indication of the value, whether how close the value is to the um, to, to to the to the price of of the of the share of the company. Uh, you want to look at cash flow. All this builds your picture of the financial performance. Forward. The last point here I've put is well, I understand the difference in enterprise value and equity value. This is something I've just been learning more about myself recently. It's it's more common nowadays for these big tech companies especially to have uh, a lot of investments themselves so the, the the enterprise value is is the value of the business and what it does it's it makes widgets it makes bicycles cars whatever it, that on its own doesn't tell you the whole story in often cases these companies will have huge um investments in, in other tech companies. I said bicycles is a wrong example. We're probably talking about the NVIDIAs uh, of the world who have uh, investments in other chip providers. Uh, so that as a whole, uh, you get a, a bigger, more accurate picture of the true value of the share, the equity value. Um, and that's something to, to bear in mind. It wasn't around 10 years ago even, uh, but it's become much more of an important factor now. So I hope I'm keeping everybody. I'm going to pass over in a second to Adam. Let's just understand what we understand by uh, guidelines for building wealth. Um, avoid money sitting in the bank account. Um, low interest rates plus inflation equals less real value. So we may be in a position where the inflation is starting. Well, we've already seen it starting to creep up. So we are into a different area. But traditionally, for the last few years, the idea has been that the record low interest rates um, will not grow your money in a, in a bank. You won't be getting any uh, interest paid by the bank for keeping your money there. So you have to put it out in the markets 
and you have to put it to work uh, better for you in order to keep up with inflation, cost of living going up every every year. Building a diversified portfolio, again, putting these assets together to reduce the risk, sort of finding a negative correlation between different assets to reduce your overall risk. 15 to 20 companies, um, stocks, countries, and different assets. There's all sorts of different ways of, of finding diversification, not just different companies, but sometimes different assets within the portfolio. Again, uh, traditionally you have sort of, sort of bonds and a sort of cash element, maybe a small part for trading, and also the, the longer term, uh, we used to call them blue chip stocks, but uh, it's a bit of an old fashioned term now. You want to develop a routine for searching out stocks um, and always be ready with a watch list of stocks that can replace uh, shares that start to collapse, start to go down, start to lose value in the portfolio. You want to take them out. Um, if they go down to a certain amount and you think, well, you know, they're not performing, take them out, find another share that is going up. And uh, to do that, you want to always want to have a sort of a short a watch list. You don't have to be that scientific about it, but just a, a general um, four or five that companies that you've got your eye on and you're sort of keeping an eye on what's happening uh, to them as well. You don't want to be, you don't need to be a professional um, financial expert, but you do need to start to connect global events with the company's fortunes, especially you'll do this naturally. Whenever you invest in a stock, you'll start to hear it's near everywhere, all the news channels and everything you read, you'll be drawn to. It's like buying a car and then driving on the street. You see every other car is the same make and model. You start to see them all of a sudden. So you will, but you, what you want to do is to try to understand how sort of global events, if it's a global company or even if it's just a domestic company, how events can impact that. And I've put there pandemics, of course, wars, strikes, human rights, tax, tax. Well, we've all heard about the new uh, news about the global effort to try to get the tech companies to um, pay more tax in the, in the countries where they do want more sales, the Amazons and the, the Facebooks and Googles and so forth. So uh, these things can, can have an impact on, on the share price. Understanding good money management and risk control as well. That's something that we're going to be looking at in more detail in part four uh, on the 7th of July. So we've still got another session uh, to go. Just leave you with uh, an idea of some of the good websites um, that I've been using over the years for fundamental analysis. Fetivest.co.uk, that's uh, an investment system that lots of great free uh, information on there as well about building a portfolio. Uh, I used to work with Vectivest for quite a few years, a uh, very good organization. Um, they do have some sort of subscriptions and services there, but that's not the reason I'm putting it there, of course. The reason I'm putting it there is because they also have a great wealth of information free on the website, which can help you to understand putting a portfolio together, building a watch list and how to analyze and find of all, all undervalued shares. Uh, behind the balance sheet .com, um, Stephen Clapham, who has spoken with me on many webinar events the last couple of years, ex uh, London fund manager, hedge fund manager, and brilliant information there. He's got some online courses, some of it's directed towards institutional uh, level fund managers. Um, but I suggest you go to his YouTube page, look at his uh, Valuation 101 uh, series of videos. Uh, which is there and it's very, very good. Sharesalt.org, these are all UK specific websites. So if you're not UK, I apologize, but uh, we're, we're, we're concentrating on the on the UK this evening. Sharesalt is the, the share um, owners club. Uh, Alphbeshpatel.com, again, a, another contact of mine who offers great, lots of free information on these websites. This is the reason I'm giving you the information is, is, is it's a great sources of uh, information about how to go about becoming an investor. LSE.co.uk, that's not London Stock Exchange, that's LondonSoutheast.co.uk. Great website, lots of great tools, proactiveinvestors.co.uk. Uh, there you will find fantastic interviews with the uh, CEOs every day, uh, updates from companies, company reports, latest announcements from CEOs um, that you can drill into. Uh, and London Stock Exchange is, of course, itself. They have the personal investing hub on the website. Um, well worth going 
to access that. Uh, and last but not least, of course, for nickelbank.co.uk, where there's just some great information, and particularly you just need to open an account. Open, it's free to free to open an account. There's no deposit required. There's no fees. There's no just account subscriptions or anything, but it opens the door to all these services, all the education, all the services for the different uh, trading platforms, uh, whether it be CFDs, Forex, stocks, uh, multi-currency. So you're going to be uh, trading US, UK and European shares in their domestic currencies. Books, four out of what is about biggest market really on Amazon books. Um, but these are for that I've heard everybody coming back. Lots of speakers will recommend them because they are a good read. Um, I've read them all, um, not recently I have to say, but they stick with you. A Random Walk Down Wall Street, uh, The Intelligent Investor, that's, uh, I have to admit that we, we sort of uh, cribbed the name for this series of workshops from Benjamin Graham's famous book. Uh, the definitive book on value investing, reminiscences of a stock operator as well by Edwin Lefebvre, the uh, story of Jesse Livermore, um, the, the investment strategy of Jesse Livermore from the 1920s, with a, and of course, Market Wizard by Jack Swagger, who has written these fantastic books, interviewing traders all over the world and finding out their strategies. Right, I am going to stop there and allow Adam to take over. And I hope that's been fun. When we get um, towards the end, we'll come back. I'd like to show you a little bit about the stock screener tool. But for the moment, let me pass over to our main presenter for this evening, um, Adam Harris. And I can see Adam there. Do I pass it over, Adam? Can you grab the presenter? I, I can do that. Uh, Thanks, Simon. Antonio. <clears throat> Thanks, Simon. Great. Sorry. Yeah, I went over again. I'm so sorry about that. But uh, it, I, I got to be honest. Don't. It was it was fantastic. And actually, you contributed. You filled in the gaps. Okay. So there was stuff that you spoke about that I'm not going to talk about today, but it is relevant. It's just because we, you know, we. This is an ongoing challenge that we face every time we do this series. People join in and they come in in part three and they miss out on part two and they miss out on part one. It's not a criticism. It's just that's just how the world works. You know, you only hear about it. You know, at that point. So. Um, so it's so nice that you did that because you covered those those uh, elements. Uh, I just want to share. There we go. Okay, so it's see screen one is this, making sure it's this correct screen. There we go. You should. Uh, there we go. I'm just going to move you guys off to the side, and I'm going to break off the questions thing so that I can see all the questions as they come through. Um, there you go. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me again. It's always a pleasure. And um, I wanted to add I've, the books that were recommended are bang on. Um, I'm just going to recap on those very quickly because I've also got a couple of books and there's some overlap. So Reminiscences of a Stock Operator uh, is uh, must be 100 years now, give or take. The guy traded the 1929 stock crash. So give, there we go, almost that. And one of the most amazing things when you read it is that you will realize that the, he'll talk about the way people thought and the way they responded and you'll be like, that's exactly what goes through my head now. And then that will reinforce the idea that the markets haven't changed in many, many ways, or at least people haven't changed. The way we behave hasn't changed. Um, and it's it's a great read. It's very much a great Gatsby feel. It's that period in time. Uh, it's got that kind of feel and it's a true story. So it's just uh, the language is old fashioned, but it really is a worthwhile read. Then I've got uh, Market Wizard series. He does this like every 10 years. He's doing another one right now. This one is an interview with people from all walks of life who've each found their own way. So it's inspiring because it will remind you that um, some of these people don't come from financial backgrounds. Um, it, there's a whole set. I mean, I should have added the Turtle Trader series to that, actually. That's also a great one. It's the Turtle Trader um, series of, or the Turtle Trader book at any rate. Excuse me. And that was, if you've ever heard of the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, was inspired by the true story of uh, the Turtle Trading program. So very, very cool. I wanted to add to that as well. Um, so these are the ones, let me just move this across a bit. Uh, I need to get behind you. Can you move? Uh, it doesn't really want to help me do that. Um, so let's just do this thing. Uh, then I have, because you're being stubborn. Um, the other one that I wanted to add to that, is the sound all right? Can you hear me okay? Simon's gone, okay. Um, so Larry Sounds, Williams. Uh... Is all right, Adam. It's okay. All right, thanks. thanks. Um, 
Larry Williams offers one. It's also, I, I love his stuff because it's also very statistical, very data driven. Um, and uh, what's unique is that there's this trading competition in the US, which he still holds the record for. Uh, I think he took something like $10,000 to 1.6 million or something in a year and he held that record. Uh, and then his daughter um, is number two. She's got second place in this. And uh, her name is Michelle Williams, and she's the actress actually in The Great Gatsby, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's her. So very funny because I didn't mean for that coincidence, but she's actually an actress anyway. And so that's just a great example of um, technical and price action additional stuff. If you want to know um, some good books to have a look at, that one's great. One Up on Wall Street. I would absolutely encourage you to have a look at this. One Up on Wall Street, the book. I, I buy the audio books because then... When I'm walking the dogs, going for a run, or I'm out and about, or I'm traveling, I can get through the book if I listen to it at 1.25 or 1.5, one and a half speed. I can get through a book in about three hours, like really quick, and and I can do it again and again. I always find it very interesting, uh, and this is phenomenal because he takes wisdom that's collected from a whole lot of different people, Warren Buffett's and all these different people, and it's very about it's much more about uh, common sense approaches to the markets. Uh, and so I would encourage that these are ones that are interesting and you definitely come away with value from them. The intelligent investor to me is the foundation for, and this is why we called this series, the intelligent investor approach actually as an homage to Ben Graham and to Warren Buffett, because this is the approach it's meant to be, the markets have changed. So back then, um, 70 years ago, the markets had very few cogs made up of different types of, like it was a, a simpler system. And so the markets, it was easy to kind of see how one thing fed another, like bonds versus, you know, um, government spending and versus inflation. It was easy to track it. Today, it's much more complex. So even, even Buffett and myself, but just a fantastic book to read because it will remind you, it has, for example, one of the things that espouses, which we repeat today, which comes off another amazing investor, which I'm going to show you now is John C. Bogle. Uh, he, they talk about your portfolio being weighted between bonds and stocks. And this, and there's an explanation for that in great detail in the intelligent investor. So audiobook on that, absolutely amazing. Uh, very, very cool. And then the last one on the list is a common sense uh, approach to investing by John C. Bogle. If you YouTube them, you get some really nice little like 20 minute documentary on, on them. So you can see who they are. John C. Bogle had an immense, uh, he created a fund and he just, he kept the costs low. There's a lot of um, inspiration in what I'm going to talk about today from that. Uh, and so he got some good guidance. What all of them really talk about is how th there's a couple of common themes that, that I want you to take away from today's session. They are um, that uh, the individual can, uh, with common sense, outperform um, most fund managers. That's like the one thing they're insistent on. Even Buffett says, he can teach you everything that you need to know in less than a week which means that having an MBA or having a CTA or something isn't necessarily the key to success. Okay. That is not a fan of hedge funds feels again, that they justify their existence. So in other words, they, they kind of, you know, it's called what's known as intellectual masturbation. It's just justification for that. And often a very straightforward rule based approach to um, the markets um, is the best way to go. And then staying the course, very important to stay the course. So that those are the books. Absolutely, uh, John C. Bogle, Common Sense to Investing, Value Investing, Benjamin Graham, absolutely must do. One Up on Wall Street, fascinating because I love his quotes. One of the nicest quotes that came out of that, and, and it's important, again, I'm bringing them up because they were I was going to anyway, uh, is that Buffett says that there are two things that determine, essentially two things that determine the price of the stock. One is the, the, the actual value of, of the company. In other words, how much money it's making, assets and liabilities, and it's, it's kind of its balance sheet. And that, that you know, if the company is profitable, which it should be, um, then you get a sense of its actual value. However, its stock price does not necessarily reflect that um, because the stock price has an added dimension of the public's um, share, you know, the, the public's ownership of those shares and therefore their perception of the company. And so basically, the whole point is that this is where Buffett finds his way in. He finds a company that share price is undervalued. He's looking at the actual performance of the company, but its share price has not been noticed by buyers in the open market, and therefore it's undervalued. Uh, and so he says, look, this is the one thing where the market can constantly 
orbit its true value because the, the public is not interested in it, then they are interested in it, and there's this crowd movement which over which causes it to be overvalued and then causes it to be undervalued. And so this is another thing that's really interesting is he talks about how Buffett doesn't have to look at a stock chart. He doesn't have to look at the chart because to him, the chart is just plotting the value of the company. He's already determined the value of the company from looking at the books and looking at the company and investigating it. And so he feels that the, looking at the charts is irrelevant. He has already done the numbers and he knows roughly where, where the value is at. So he's so that's fascinating to me that he won't even have to look at the share price to, I mean, to look at a chart to know if it's undervalued or overvalued. But this series that we are doing today is technical analysis, combining that with fundamental analysis. And in other words, how can we visually confirm that a company is also a good investment? So in other words, we're not straying from the principles. We're saying, look, if we look at a company of that Buffett would qualify, we could also see what it looks like visually, and then we can reverse engineer that. So if it's performing well based off its, its chart structure, if we reverse engineer, if we find another company that has the same history, that has a similar chart structure, the implication is that the underlying fundamentals are already in place. So we're cheating. It's a little bit of a shortcut. It's not a complete shortcut. There is work involved, but it does mean at a good as a good indicator of how they're doing. And also, it can help us avoid some of the more dud ones. We'll talk about some of those uh, in a moment. So that was so basically he was saying that the public's perception can be behind the curve. And another great example of that is Tesla. Tesla's not new to anyone. Um, we've all known about it for years, and they only really recently had a breakout. And that breakout compensated for the fact that it didn't go anywhere for years. And so Tesla has always been available for people to buy. They just weren't interested in it because it wasn't moving. And so it's kind of counter, that's the problem, is that people aren't interested in something until it moves. Bitcoin has been around for ages. It had its first bubble and came down and therefore was available to everyone. But because it came all the way down, no one wanted to touch it. So in other words, we're only, the uneducated people are only interested in stuff when it's popular. And that's the biggest problem, is chasing something because it's popular. And actually, success definitely doesn't come from that. That is the one thing that's going to get in the way of your success, is chasing something because it's popular. So just keep that in mind. So that was fantastic. The stock screen as well um, that uh, that Simon mentioned is just lovely. It's fantastic. So get a chance. Please go and play with it. Uh, it really, really is great. And uh, so I, I was just playing with it very quickly, kind of went through, picked a sector, just picked like capital goods, raw materials, because they're starting to display inflation. So this is the concern at the moment. Um, Anyway, and there's no real fear about inflation. Inflation, the fear with inflation is, oh my, you know, like, what are we going to do if inflation goes the way it has in some countries during the war when there's buckets of cash going around, that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, inflation in, in its own way is going to curb spending. Um, and the, the, the central banks have kind of put themselves in a situation where they can't really lower interest rates, which is somehow we've changed from, you know, up until the last, up and up until the last, 30 years, we were always, the, the central bank's job was to curb growth by increasing interest rates. Now the problem is because they haven't done it at the right time, they can't do it now. Um, so in other words, we couldn't necessarily survive it if the interest rates had to go up, but they need to do that. So now they don't do that, so they have to do stimulus and spending cash and stuff. And so what do you do if you have inflation combined with that? And that's kind of really where the worry is. Now, if you have a relatively decent income and you have savings and you're not too overstretched on your debts, you could handle a bit of an increase, a kind of cost of living increase if you do that. But if your income is very low and you've got a lot of debt, you're in trouble. And so the problem we have is that more of the middle class has gone into debt um, in the last 30 years than before. So you now have a wider gap between the wealthy and the middle class and the, and the lower income, not lower class, lower incomes are down at the bottom. There's this gap between them. And that wasn't always the case. They kind of used to be more balanced. Anyway, so this is the this is the fear. So it's really nice. And what was interesting to me is I kind of uh, wanted to then to ran a filter on it. And then what I was kind of doing was looking, if I hover my mouse over it, I can get a, a, a glance at the kind of at the performance of the chart. And so this is what I'm bringing to the table today is kind of I'm looking for something that generally is has a nice performance so this one for example i'd pass on this one i might go look at it to see how it looks but i don't like the fact that it, at the end it's heading down like i really am not a huge fan of that but one way to confirm that is to go look at it you know go look at it full screen thank you the menu is coming up here there we go and so have a look at it on like a yearly basis and see now overall that's fine that performance is perfectly fine so therefore it still qualifies this is what i want i want something that has a general performance to the upside. And, and I believe I'm the same as Buffett in this respect. I expect 
these things to be it's not acceptable that it goes down for two years when I get in. I want it to be performing within the same year that it should be profitable. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over to my slide deck in a moment. I just wanted to show you this. Another one that I was looking at, for example, Cornish Metals. Very, very nice. So this the scanner because is a great way of, um, you know, going through different stock exchanges uh, and sectors and working through that and then getting a short list that I can then go and have a look at the charts and then I can make further decisions because that it's very intimidating. And again, it doesn't have to be this way. If I look at the monthly or the weekly chart, I can determine, I can I could go through this exercise every three months. It doesn't have to be a weekly thing. Um, and I only need, and so let's get onto the slide deck because you know this doesn't have to be a long and lengthy thing. So I said part three or three, but we're actually doing four parts. So I need to update that, I apologize. It's a four part thing. And I think Simon's taking you through a disclaimer, so I'm going to skip this one. But basically, excuse me, what we're not, we're, our goal is not to get you my goal. I'm an, I'm an independent investor here, and, and Antonio's gone to great lengths as well for that same reason. And Simon has given great content on that, is to try to basically offer you inspiration in terms of why you might at least consider this and why you might do it, um, but not to direct you to anything specific. Um, and I just think again here, I've changed the quote today, which is really to say that complexity is the enemy of, I'm reading a note that came up, complexity is the enemy of success. Uh, trading and investing is much more about doing the basic things really well. And I think Buffett would agree uh, with me on that. Complexity, if it's very complex, the reasoning behind it, that's in inherently not a great, because the more complex things are, the more fragile they are, the more susceptible they are to just kind of breaking because they don't work quite well. So we're going to cover some core ideas that I want you to take away. These are concepts that I want you to kind of embed if I can plant them in your head. Choosing a path, talk about what our different options are. We're going to talk about price action, what actually happens there, and a strategy today as well. Because I, I, last time I said that I'm going to be discussing a strategy today, and I really want to do that. And we'll do some market analysis as well. Um, so again, for those of you who don't know me very quickly, who am I? This is my second career. I was a technical director and an owner of a company uh, that had offices in, in Zurich and in South Africa. And uh, we used to do visual effects and animation. So I got into the industry literally just after Jurassic Park. So I was probably a random piece of trivia, probably the first 20 people on, on the, in, in, in the, like there was a very small people. It was maybe a thousand people in the world back then who were doing it. And now there's probably a thousand people in your neighborhood doing this kind of thing. Um, and then I wanted to, I sold my shares and I wanted to kind of, I, I did some research, property and, and investing stocks historically came out to be the best ways to increase your wealth. And, and I wish I had known this when I was 16. So I could have started at 16 because there's nothing stopping me from doing it then. Um, and anyway, and then I've been trading funds since 2014, professionally trading, uh, sorry, since 2016, I beg your pardon. Um, and then obviously I speak at events and stuff like that. My trading doesn't take me more than a few hours a day. So my average day, I'm up at six. Um, I spend the first hour or two either exercising or re reading, meditating, other stuff, because the whole world is quiet at that point. And then I'm at my desk at about 8 to 8.30, and then I'm my chat group. I'll talk in my chat group, and I've got my trade set up. If my trade set up at 7.30, or I'll take them, that's fine. Um, but it doesn't take more than collectively, maybe a half an hour of my day to actually action that stuff, which gives me a whole day to do stuff. So this is why I end up um, doing this stuff as well. Um, so what are the core ideas? Let me just have a quick drink. So these are taken from, and I've left the close brackets, sorry about that, inspired by Benjamin Graham, who wrote the book, who was Warren Buffett's university lecturer. And basically, gave him most of his ideas. And I also wanted to add, I was thinking about it today, Warren Buffett learned on the job. So most of what he knows, you know, he got his basic ideas from, from Benjamin Graham, and then he's added stuff to it that he's learned on the job. I think that's really important because it means that even, what, you know, the best investor of our time, or one of the best investors, didn't learn everything that he knew at university. He had to go and, and do it. So and, and my point being is that curiosity is probably the best attribute to have when when shifting from a non-financial approach to life to trying to pick up the skills to do this just being curious is probably the, the best attribute to have you'll pick everything up from there so john c bogle's big about this he talks about costs being a make or break factor now the costs are dropping today they're maybe the best they've ever been historically and i'm talking here about the cost per trade or the cost for management fees they're quite um they become more competitive um, but we do want to be aware of costs. Every everywhere we go, we want to be aware of what are the costs of of a position we take, of a 
of a trade we take or, or you know, buying shares, what are those transaction costs is what I'm referring to, the transaction costs. They do make a difference. So what I mean is if you, um, let's say inflation's at 8%, which is kind of what the US is calculating their inflation rate is at now, uh, you know, and you happen to have a portfolio that, let's say, makes 38% in the year, because some people have done really well. So let's say you do that, but you've also got to subtract your costs and inflation and so on and so forth. And you end up with, you know, let's say you don't, let's say you make 12% in a year, minus inflation, minus those costs and you end up neutral. So you have something that performs incredibly well, but it's just eroded by costs. So costs are a factor. We do want to take that into account. Over time, and this is the explanation, inflation, management fees, and other costs erode profits, sometimes negatively. The reason I'm bringing this up, it might seem trivial, but in the book that John C. Bogle wrote, which is the little book of investing, the red one that I that I, I put up there, which I'll, I'll give you the list in a moment. Um, he he covers probably half the book is, is talking about how firms can erode the profits you make. Okay, so let's say that the market does, um, you know, the S&P does 14% that year, then in theory, they shouldn't necessarily have made the firm should not necessarily have made more than 14% because the market didn't do it. So how could they have, which means that they would have made 14% or less, and then you've got to deduct the fees, and then there's all kinds of overhead costs, and then you come away with much less. So at the end of the day, maybe you come away with 8 or 9%, but the market did 13 or 14 So it can mess with your head quite a bit, definitely something that you want to be aware of. And again, statistically, you probably have as good a chance, if not greater chance than then, so the, the greatest reason basically to consider self-management is also keeping in mind that statistically, most fund managers often fail to outperform the markets. This is, I want to expand on that. They fail to outperform the markets because they, they mess around too much. They're chasing the wrong things. Uh, and these are professionals, by the way, and they chase the wrong things or they're all over the place. And they've come up with very complex research analysis things that explain why they should get involved in some markets and not others, and they dismiss things that are that show potential. There's a lot of reasons if you look into it, and they often just don't outperform markets. So sometimes a simple index fund will outperform them. And then you get the fees on top of it. So they don't even outperform the market, but you also pay a large fees. So this is, these are just things to think about. What else erodes profits? Obviously, this is very important to take into account. Rotation of portfolio, which means getting in and out of the markets too often and then I say, no, I'm explaining it when benchmarked against average growth. So what this means is getting in and out of stocks every three months or something, or, or getting out as soon as they crash and then getting back in when they boom, uh, that's kind of counterproductive. And doing that three or four times a year on each thing basically means that you'll just get nailed on the transaction costs and then you'll erode any profits you make. When we trade, when we're trading stuff, we're, it's a slightly different, it's not a slightly different, it's a different approach. We are usually risking, for example, half a percent or a quarter of a percent or 1% per position we take. And usually that position will yield three or 4% and the cost will be a fraction of that 1%, they'll be quite small. So the net profit on that will be two or 3% on that single position. Um, and we might do that several times a year. So the, the cost transaction cost um, is already taken into account. And so that that's trading as opposed to investing. But investing, when you're just gonna buy and hold and the market's gonna go up and down and up and down and you're, you're, you're getting the net growth on it, you want one transaction because, or you want a one low cost transaction if you can. The goal, ideally, where we want to get to is dividends, meaning we're trying to build up a portfolio. So this always threw me when I was first getting to know uh, Warren Buffett, where was, he would say he never, he would never sell a stock. The better it does, the less reason there is for him to sell it. Um, and what he, that's because he never really stated that where he's really going is dividends. That's what he's looking for. He, he wants the money that he lives off and his lifestyle is very low cost is the dividends. That's where you're really where it gets you. So that's kind of the goal you want to get to. Um, when we're talking about investing, we want to get to a point. So you kind of want to work backwards from that. And if you do that properly, if you're paying attention to that, you'll probably make other sensible decisions because you'll be making decisions around that. However, one um, exception to that is picking a stock that has great dividends that doesn't go anywhere, that's losing value. So that idea, the analogy I use is buying um, a property to to rent out to make rental income. And so the problem is that if the property starts to lose value, 
that value could be as much as you ultimately made on it in rental income or rental profits after taxes when you decide to sell it. So what you really want, your goal should be to get buy a property that is going to maintain its worth. And obviously you've got cost of maintaining the property as well. So there's other overheads and costs or increase in value in line with you know, healthy growth and, and properties in that area. The, the rule of thumb is double in value every 10 years. Property, the last, since 2000, has been doubling in value like every five years, but it should be every 10 years. Um, and so that means that that's your frame of reference. So you want to work backwards. You want something that increases in value and produces those. This, that's kind of the, the, the general goal here. So when we look at the charts, and this is where technical analysis wins hands down, which is what we're going to do is we can determine the probable trend of that particular stock probable. And we're not just doing it off short based stuff. We're looking on, on 10, 20 years worth of performance. A suggested approach. This is interesting. So this comes from, uh, this comes from uh, one of the other books that I listed there as well is to use our age as a percentage guide to a ratio of stocks versus bonds in our portfolio. And that could be a bond index or a stock index as well, is that if we're 25 years old, for example, we want more growth, we are more aggressive. Um, and so we're going to do more, our weighting would be more stocks and less on bonds. Okay. The bonds are stable, but not much growth necessarily. And the stocks would yield a lot more of that. And so that's when we're building up our net worth. Uh, as we get older, we want more stability and calm and more sleep you know, better sleep at night, even though we don't sleep better, apparently. Um, and so then we would drop our weighting on stocks and then more onto bonds. That's the idea. Okay. Um, it's just a thought. These are just things that, you know, you're like, oh, I get that. That makes sense to me. Okay. And it's meant to inspire you. Um, and then this is an interesting one as well, choosing the most stable currency wherever possible. So in the US, for example, their argument is biggest GDP in the world. China is coming up close behind. But if you take China out, the US is the biggest. It's bigger than the next eight countries combined. Bigger than the UK, Japan, just Europe, you put it all together, it's massive. So in America, and in America, you can become a multimillionaire or billionaire just selling to Americans. That's how big that it kind of, that's just how big their economy is. Um, and so in their minds, they're going, well, you know, they buy and sell and live in US dollars and they might as well just do the US stock market. However, I do think there's something to be said for other markets around the world where there's growth happening. But what I want to put down here is for you to consider, um, not just this currency, consider the strongest economy in the world, consider the US stocks, if, if you can gain them and add them to your portfolio, if you could do that, definitely worth a consideration. Um, the US, you know, for example, you could ask yourself, how, how, you know, how confident am I that the UK, you know, is stable, the economy is stable for the next 10 years? How, how confident am I? And so it's really based around that idea. But I'm just saying, the, consider the idea of looking at other, uh, other economies. Okay. So now what you're going to come down to is, and, and I think this is an important discussion to have, is what are my options as an individual? Like how active do I have to be doing this? Is there a kind of a low maintenance option here or not? So here, here's what we can do. The degree of activity, which is important to consider. This is not meant to be something, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that we actually, um, that we take action on on a daily basis. This is something that we, that we might, where we make it, transaction or make it get in and out of the markets maybe once in a month or something. We can spend the rest of the month analyzing it, but the actual transaction, the action of getting in and out, we don't have to, we would only do once a month or maybe not even for six months. The reason is not to overanalyze, not to overthink about it, not to meddle too much, and then we become our own worst enemies. I love this expression where we get in our own way because you overthink it. And you, you're building up your own trust in your own judgment. That is, this is something that we're not really taught a lot um, and, and certainly not today in society. You're kind of like, no, 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 don't, you know, don't do your own thing necessarily. Yes, you're unique. Yes, you're special, but no, 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 you, you can't do that and you can't do that. So I don't mean to sound uh, paranoid or it's not like that. I'm just saying that we've kind of don't have that skill of learning how to trust our own judgment and we have to learn to develop it. We know it in our day to day job, but when it comes to something like this, we've got to just build on it. Um, and so the best way to build on it is to just start making those decisions on our own, C come up with our own reasoning, our own logic. If we make mistakes, learn from them and move on. And you you very quickly leave the mistakes behind if you do. So it's okay. This is not rocket science. Lots of people do it, but you'll find that every person who's been really good at it has not used a complex approach. I want you to remember that they've usually used like five or six rules for whatever it is, and then stuck to those and then kept, and then kind of kept it going. Um, 
So we can create and manage our own fund portfolio of anywhere from five to 30 stocks or bonds. You could go to 60. There's actually nothing really limiting you, but the more you have, the more mental space it kind of takes up and you better have reasons for why you're involved in them and where you'd get out and where you wouldn't. Um, and so, you know, I think five is good. Diversity lowers our, this we discussed last, last time, excuse me, um, diversity reduces our risk. That's the point of diversity. Buffett, Warren Buffett feels that if you know what you're doing, you don't have to diversify because each one is in itself a strong decision. Fine. But at the same time, there might be a reason why we decide to diversify away from airlines, because maybe next time there's a, you know, we are going to have more of these um, pandemics that's in our future. As long as our population keeps growing, pandemics are the greatest risk to the global population because of the density. That's actually how it spreads. It's a biological thing. Um, and so that's our, we are going to have them in our future. So does that mean it's going to impact airlines or what's the story as an example? So we would diversify away from airlines so that we would reduce that risk as an example. Um, or we could pick five stocks we truly understand and stay with us. That's back in line with what I said with Buffett saying, if you know what you're doing, then just pick the five things you could do. And actually, this is amazing. Something to consider, which I really, really appreciate this. If you use the products, so for example, I use an iPhone or, um, you know, I shop at, Waitress or M&S or whatever, then I'm familiar with it and I can see what it is. And sometimes that's a really good insight into the value of the company because you use the products. And so that's something also worth considering is if you use a company's products or you're very familiar with it and you're a customer of it, that in the same way that, you know, Buffett has Coca-Cola and, and McDonald's every day kind of thing, that, that can be a starting point for going, this is something that's really good. And sometimes that can be something very small that nobody else has ever heard of. And so um, uh, the other chat, um, I'll go back to the books at the end. This is one of his key things. He said that most of his, what he calls a 10 bagger, which is an American expression, which comes from baseball or something. Um, a 10 bagger, meaning that not everyone you do, everyone that's added to your portfolio is going to have really good returns. But for every 10 bagger, you have an offset two or three, you know, losers that are or the ones that don't go anyway. And so basically he said that all of his really best ones tended to be ones that um, that he found the products that he knew on the streets and that he would end up going and buying those. Ones. Um, 1.3, simply buy into a few uh, stock indices. The S&P 500, the FTSE 100, Vanguard or BlackRock, these are ETFs, for example. Um, and there's a really good reason for doing that, which leads me kind of 1.4, 1.3 will make more sense in a moment. 1.4 is a single index fund. Okay, accessing the best across all markets. So where does that come from? John C. Bogle has got a great expression called don't buy the needle, buy the haystack. In other words, don't look for the needle in the haystack. Don't worry about that, buy the haystack. Um, and so his idea is saying that statistically, and the numbers support this, if, you, if a, an individual had simply uh, bought into a single index fund, which has the lowest, like, lowest transaction fees or very low transaction fees, they would not only outperform most of the fund managers, and this is statistically, and you can fact check it as well, that outperform them, but it's just a simple transaction and it really solves their issues. So in other words, you don't have to overcomplicate it. You could simply just get into a single index fund, low costs on those transactions, and then hold those positions. And what it does is generally speaking, the best performing companies will lift up, you know, the, the kind of the missteps and you'll generally, generally get most of the profits or most of the benefits and 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 very little of the risk um and there's actually another one i didn't get time to add it into the slide deck uh, which is in that situation this is really important buying and holding is the best solution so i mean get in at any time but hold so even if you get in at the top just a week or two before the market has a big correction and suddenly you're like oh you know my timing is typically i got in at the wrong time just hold it. The market will recover and you'll be back on track. So it's annoying, but you will get back on track. But then at that point, panicking and getting out at the bottom is just statistically the wrong thing to do. The best time to get in is usually at, at the bottom or near the bottom, even if you don't know where the bottom is. Once the market has had a big drop, usually um, that is a great time to start at least looking for options to get in. And historically, that's shown to be the case. Okay. So basically his whole idea of going through a single index fund. But then again, in that situation, if you build on that idea, you could do a single index fund like the S&P 500, and then you could do NASDAQ if you wanted to get technology stocks, and then you could do maybe not the FTSE. I mean, I, I, I struggle a little bit with the FTSE. I know we live in the UK, but by comparison, if, if, if I had put 
ten thousand pounds into the S and P in two thousand nine, and ten thousand pounds into the FTSE, I'd have made a fortune off the out of the U.S. economy and very little out of the U.K. economy. And the decision here is, it's not about brand loyalty. It's not about buying Barclays stock because I have a Barclays bank account. It's about performance and making money. So that should be the reasoning behind it. So the point is, you could again, if you you could combine all these ideas and say, okay, I'm going to get five you know, indexes and whether maybe one of them will be a bond, maybe one of them will be, a, or the rest will be stock indexes and then let them do all the work, let them carry the, you know, the way to the market. Um, so there's that way to do it. And then as you build your confidence up, you could, you could start to explore others like Microsoft. I'm a big fan of Costco and Microsoft because they're just rock solid. They just um, are that. Um, and so there's that. Uh, so that, let me recap that. So we could pick five that we understand and know and stay with those, which means it's not a lot to manage. And the idea is, is that if each one in itself is a sensible decision, they will carry the dud. So if one goes flat or goes down a little bit or whatever, the better ones will compensate for that. And so that's really the idea. And Buffett hinges on that. Not all of his deals have been great, but he's had far more good deals than bad deals. And they just, you know, they just solve it. And actually, if you see his performance, there have been plenty of years where, um, Berkshire Hathaway has not made much of a return and has underperformed the rest of the markets. But on the years where they've outperformed, it's been like insane. And so that so their overall track record is something ridiculous, like eight thousand percent over. You know, it's just ridiculous stuff. Um, and again, he's he's got his set rules, and then once a company is within that, he believes it's pretty stable and it should continue to perform. And that's why if the market thinks it's undervalued and he's already in it, he's not worried. He's pretty certain at some point the market will catch on. So when when Tesla finally broke out, to me it was like, well, yeah. How did you not know this was a good a good idea? Okay. So um, and so here's an example, just just conceptually talking about ETFs. Okay, performance and fees matter. So these are just examples that I I, I pinched off uh, an, uh, another page, and really wanted to just show you that, for example, here here's the management fee, which is a which is a percentage of the overall performance. Um, and you can see the difference, really. You can see how some are quite low and the performance is pretty much the same. So for example, uh, if we go with this one, which is 0.17, it's 0.1% it's more than this one and the performance is roughly the same. So it's just something to, to think about is that paying more does not necessarily equate to better performance um, in, in these cases, okay? It does not necessarily equate to that. Uh, keeping an eye on the time, because I want to go through this stuff. Mark Douglas. So there's a question here saying, what about Mark Douglas who wrote Trading in the Zone and his second book, which was The Disciplined Trader. He passed away a few years ago, tragically. And there was a moment where we were going to get some uh, mentoring from him. Um, it's a separate discussion. And he passed away tragically and he was writing another book. So hopefully you, that they're going to put that, the estate will put the book together. Fantastic. So yes, again, uh, trading in the zone. I mean, there are so many good books, but if I was putting things in the top 10, he would be in the top 10. So it's uh, Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone. It's required reading, in my opinion, for everyone. The Intelligent, um, uh, the, what was it called? The um, Disciplined Trader, also next next level. Very cool. Self-awareness is a big thing we need, to, we need to know. So just wanted to show you that because I wanted you to see the management fees in relation to the performance and that Computer. So next up, because we've got kind of like uh, 18 minutes, give or take. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, about candlesticks. Okay, so not, not it, there's two slides on this, so it's not super complex, the, but I do want to talk about these ones in particular. I'm going to talk about dojis and spinning tops. Now, as a general rule of thumb, yes, if you want to go into more detail on, on that through Steve Nissen or Al Brooks um, price action, those are options. But that's, again, sorry, my dogs are playing outside. Um, again, that's complexity. So get the course concepts. And then if you want to go more complex, that's your choice. If you enjoy it, so this is a hobby in, in a way. I mean, I do it for a living, but it's also a hobby. I love it. I could talk about it forever. Um, but so th th let's just kick off with this. So first of all, we want to be able to recognize and understand what a doji or spinning top is. Most people will just call, uh, whether it's a spinning top or a doji, they'll just say, oh, look, it's a doji or it's a spinning top. They'll just lump them together. Because really the key thing about them is that they tend to have smaller bodies than most candles, okay? Um, the doji itself, if you really need it to kind of be, uh, if you need a, a very clear definition, often has almost potentially no body at all. Open and close can be in the same place. It's usually got a very, very small body um, and it might have 
um, unequal size wicks or shadows on either end. Uh, this one as well, they tend to be quite small. But the key thing about them really is because the open and close are usually close to each other. So there's quite a bit that it communicates to you in this. The open and close tells you the market didn't really settle anywhere. So the buyers, the bulls of the bears, nobody won for the day. Nobody won that session. It explored it up and down and eventually kind of closed where it is, which means that it's either neutral. In other words, it just didn't make a decision either way, or maybe it's undecided. So it doesn't know what to do next. But in these situations, the fact that actually it did go down and then got pushed all the way back up in a way means that the bulls were very much more in control in this session. Although they closed back up where the high is, this is predominantly a slightly more bullish signal than bearish. Okay, this one as well, more bearish, this one more indecision. So, um, and a little bit of color here and there is fine. I just, by definition, I just kind of refer to this kind of bearish indecision or anything like that. But I don't obsess too much about that because the body size is so small. It's really about which side of it it's leaning. This is more bullish. This is more bearish. This is kind of more neutral. Uh, and then we have like the spinning top, which tends to have a bit more of a body. And generally speaking, the wicks or the shadows are the same length, top and bottom, generally speaking. Okay, so that's kind of a more thing. But collectively, they occur geographically where they matter, where they occur, and what they tend to proceed is what's important. Um, they tend to occur at the tops and bottoms of a lot of the time. They tend to occur at the tops and bottoms of swings or moves, and they tend to precede breakouts. The beauty of this, so I'm relaying this, I've never really encountered this anywhere out there too much, but most uh, amateur traders or newbies will not appreciate how much, uh, how valuable these are because they precede a big move. And actually when you're uncertain, when your confidence is low, you're new to this whole thing, you need to see evidence that the market's moving, which again is like nobody wanted to touch Tesla until it started moving and then they got in. They didn't want to get back into Bitcoin until it started going again and then it got back in and invariably they get in um, too late when it's already done a big chunk of a move. So the beauty of these is that they tend to precede moves and in terms of risk reward, in terms of being able to set that up, profit ratio, they are beautiful. They are the ideal kind of entry points that we want and they tend to precede big moves. So they occur at the turning points. Uh, and so if we are, for example, if I just draw over the screen, if we have a trend and it's turning, they will tend to occur at these points. And if I'm obviously because the trend is up, we spoke about this last week, what, what constitutes an uptrend or a downtrend, um, then I'm going to be looking for them the next time the price pulls back. I'm going to be ideally if I get one, I might not get one, but if I get any of these in this area, then I can start to put my entry buffer to my stop loss below it. And that becomes a very nice, potentially profitable uh, entry point. So these are incredibly valuable because they offer great reward to risk ratio. And they often, when they start, when one occurs, this could very well be um, preempting the big move. Okay. Um, they offer extremely good rewards. And especially if it happens to be sitting on a support resistance level, maybe it's sitting on a trend line or it's sitting on a moving average or it's sitting on a fib level, pivot level, that just adds extra evidence that it is finding support in an uptrend or resistance in a downtrend and that can add weighting to it so point is appreciate this take note of it we can have a look at the charts and we can talk about that in a moment then we get um yeah, yeah, yeah. then we get just full-bodied bullish and bearish candles so basically i've broken it into indecision candles and kind of bullish bearish or indecision that's really it and so in this case, what we really want, what constitutes this is kind of a long tail um, and a nice green body. That's a nice bullish candle. It's fantastic. Very much the bulls in control. Uh, it opened here, went down, got pushed all the way to the other side. The bulls completely control that session. Now I want to see if the next session they follow through. This is nice and bearish, closed right at the end. That's a good example of it. That's a full body bearish candle as well, obviously. Um, the problem with these is these tend to be the big ones. So you tend to get the indecisions and spinning tops at the turning points. This is a generalization, but it's generally true. So we will get these types of long bodied ones over here. And we often call those crowd volume candles and they can be really big. And this is often when the amateurs get in because they didn't have the confidence. This is all understandable, but it's not a good habit to keep going. Um, they all then get in and then we get the little indecision ones and little dojis at the top here as well. Okay, so we get those. Um, and we tend, so we'll tend to get those at these areas. Again, if I can get a candle like that over here, it's a great bullish buy signal. I'm not looking to counter trend trade. That's not a very smart way to trade the markets. If the market is trending, I'm only looking to buy and I'm only looking to get in on the dips. 
and therefore I want to see candles that look like this. This could even be red, it's possible. You could have it open, you could actually have the market open here, go down, get pushed up and close here. So you could get a bullish red candle. It's also acceptable. We'll see those on the charts in a moment. Um, and these are things that I like to get. The size is important. This is where size does matter. Uh, I guess size always matters, but in this case, it can be small and that's all right. So a smaller, again, a smaller candle like this, I would prefer to have it a small one, not a big one. Okay, we'll see those actually when we go look at the charts in a moment. So these are fantastic entry signals as long as they are small. And how do we determine it's small? Best way to do it is we look at the chart, we see what a big one looks like, and then from there we can gauge what constitutes a small one. So I'll show you that in practice. So I want to talk about contrarian as well. 11 minutes to go. I want to talk about contrarian. Okay, so contrarian, the contrarian, I'm going to read it off the off the, off the the slide. The contrarian approach is when an individual, a person, okay, goes counter to the prevailing sentiment, meaning the market is bull in a bull market or it's trending upwards, technically. However, this is most often reached when an inexperienced investor gets an idea in their head, they get a bias in their head that the market cannot possibly go any higher. It's ridiculous. They're listening to the news and they're listening to all kinds of things and they're just going, no, I can't keep going, I can't keep going. And they form this bias, okay, for whatever reason. It's almost a, an instinctive like bias and okay, as opposed to based on evidence. Or for example, a stock is, you know, there's, um, a stock, they're buying a stock that's been going down for five years and they go, look, it's got to go up at some point and it just keeps going down. It can go down to zero. A stock can go down to zero. So buying a stock that historically is going down and has been for several years is just not a great idea. And it's quite interesting because a lot of fundamentals, fundamental analysts, and I've met a couple, I actually shared a webinar um, with respect, and I clearly does know his stuff, but all the ones he was recommending were ones that I'd gone, this has been going on for five years, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot bodge ball. And he was going, well, I think it's a great deal. And he's looking at the fundamentals. The only catch is that sometimes with fundamentals, we can come up with reasons that sound rational as to why something's a good deal when it actually isn't. Um, and so for me, it was the performance. If the performance hasn't been going anywhere, then why would it suddenly change now if nothing else has changed about it? So that was my reasoning. Um, so most often this results in huge losses for the individual and immense stress. So these are the things that cause people to, to lose money because they start overthinking things or they get an idea in their head that is based off some kind of a belief and that creates a bias. And this is something we all do. So this is a common mistake in the beginning that we have to shake out very quickly is the, the rule should be that if it's the market's trending up, we're buyers. And that is just end of story. There is no other option. We cannot be sellers. That just should be a fixed rule. In a way that should just be built into the platforms that you just can't short the markets if you don't want to. But that is where the brokers can. And I'm not actually referring here to, to Finico at all. I'm, I'm saying that this is where brokers make a lot of money because people, people make silly mistakes like shorting a market that's going up or buying a market that's going down. And so they hand over their money. And so let's just not do that. Let's just go with the market. You can go, if the market goes from an uptrend to a downtrend, you can start shifting. So the problem in those cases, that's usually an uneducated individual. I'm not referring to the, the, the educated contrarians, and there's not a lot of them. They have to see a huge amount of um, Michael Burry, who in the big short, who had the actual statistics on mortgages and, and defaults and everything. They had the data there and they had a really good reasoning behind shorting those markets and going against it. And they had to create the instruments. They had to get those instruments created. And even then, you know, the banks and the rating agencies worked against them because like they, they, were mis they weren't paying attention. So there are situations like that, but they're not as a day to day, year on year approach. It just doesn't appear to be contrarian because contrarian events happen very rarely. And it feels like you're going against the grain and most people didn't believe them and they were ostracized in their own ways, even after Michael Burry made his clients, whatever that, that 800% return or whatever it was, I forget the exact number, his clients never spoke to him again because he, he put them through so much stress that they didn't understand what he was doing. So it's just not a, a good way to go about things. The best way to do it is just go with the market. Don't go against it. Uh, and then you won't feel like the market's against you because you're going with it. Anyway, um, so statistically, the markets go up more than they go down. That means if you look at it, especially in the US, they go up. They go, they spend way more time going up than they do going down. They spend way more time going up than they even do going sideways. So therefore, if I was going to be contrarian, the best time would be if the market is having a steep drop off is when everyone else is panicking, that's when I would start to get in. And that's what Buffett does as well. He loves it when the market's 
um, because he feels that his companies are so stable, they will survive, as um, Simon said in the beginning, they will survive wars and all kinds of things that break out and they'll, they will, there might be a wobble here and there, but they will. Um, and so therefore, what you're really banking on is the longer term, you're never really banking on a shorter term thing, which is not what this webinar series is about. We talk about day trading and other in other webinar series. This is about patience, picking something, sticking with it, letting it, giving it time to bake, so to speak. Um, and so just to show you the stats on that, six months to two, 2.8 years for the average kind of uh, bear market, 3.8, let's call it four years to 10 years or more, 12, 13, 14, 15 years in a bull run um, to have those corrections. Okay, so it's just not worth going through shorting the market, just is not worth it. Uh, and if you truly want to be contrarian, obviously be a buyer when the market's actually crashing. And when I say crashing, it could, you could be a buyer here, you could be another buyer there. The goal isn't to put ourselves all in, we don't go all in, we never go all in. We go, we just, that's, we want to be in that position to be, okay, I'm going to take on some shares here. I'm going to take on some shares here. You might even find one you really like and you've already got shares in it and you go, actually, I'm just going to add up on that, which is exactly what Buffett would do. Um, okay, so let's talk about strategy. Okay, so we, we what I've got on the chart here is, and, and I'm happy with, I've got simple moving averages, but actually I would go with exponential this, this, this time around. It's dealer's choice, but I would go with exponential moving averages. So I've got the 200, the 50, and the 20 on my chart. Um, the first thing that I actually want in place, ideally, is a trend. So I want to find a chart that is actually trending. I'm not looking at something that's going sideways. This is really find a chart that is trending, and then you're looking to get in on that trend. So no, it's the very first thing that you really want to have in place is a trend. Now, I should add that this strategy works incredibly well on the weekly charts. So it might mean that I'm holding that position for three to six weeks, which is not so bad. It's, you know, it's a month or two. Um, and the returns on those for me, if I'm risking 1% or half a percent of each of those positions, I'm usually looking to get what's known my, my I'm looking to make 2R to 4R on those, okay, meaning to make two times or three times my initial risk. Yes, they are losing ones. I actually tend to find fewer losing ones on the weekly because the weeklies tend to be much kind of cleaner and simpler and the daily gets a little bit more volatile. So like Facebook is incredibly tricky to trade on the daily, but very easy to trade on the weekly by comparison. Okay, so go where, and, and again, to hold a position for a few weeks or, or a quarter, maybe three to six months at a time, um, is, is worthwhile. And I feel that I'm getting the, the basis of these moves, sort of a 200, the 50, the 20 um, moving averages. And really what I want is, first of all, I want price on top of those moving averages. So ideally, I want price above um, the 50, 20, and 10. I would like all of those moving averages to be going up. Okay, so in other words, that means that the shorter term and the longer term trend is more established and, and then um, really what I'm looking for is, is a correction or a retracement right? I need price to come back towards the moving averages uh, so I said here that it, I kind of need at least one red correction uh, I need at least one you know day to come back towards the moving averages and um, and then I'm looking to potentially place my entry so let's just use this one here as an example I actually had price correct and then a little bit of a bullish red candle. It's got a nice little wick underneath. And then what I would do is place my entry, uh, my order around it. So my entry one point, at least closest, no closer than one point, obviously above the high. My stop loss one point below the low if I want to do that. Um, and then usually I might do that actually just before the market closes. I might just do that. And then if I want to do it before the market closes, uh, because occasionally the markets might gap up. But I don't really have to always do that. I can just leave the orders and then they can get triggered the next day when the markets, when the market opens. Um, and then... Uh, in a case like this, if it does really move beautifully, almost right out the gates, then I will usually update my stop loss after about five days. So usually I'll wait for the first day I'm triggered in, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, and then update my stop loss. Okay, and then I'll update it every single day after that until I get stopped out, or I can leave it for a few days. You know, some people vary on this. And again, we've got part four next week, and I'm going to expand on this strategy. I'm going to spend more time on it. Um, but actually, I apologize because I realized that we're running low on time and I'm not going to get to the charts as much time as I wanted to spend on this. Um, but I do think the stuff I did up front was also more worthwhile. So there are a couple of losing trades in situations like here. For example, there's a nice little bit of a correction here. There's a little bit of a green candle there. I usually would have put my entry above the high of that green candle and my stop loss below the low. So the, the whole point is I'm trying to find the turning point. That's actually what I'm looking for. Um, and in that situation, my entry is above the green, my stop loss below the low of the previous candle. And then it survives that kind of shakeout period. 
Um, but there are a couple here, for example, this one as well. I'll put my entry above the high of this one, stop loss below the low. I do get in. I potentially maybe make 1% on that, and then I would get stopped out. I might, um, you know, maybe if I do move my stop loss in after one, two, three, four, I'm out. So I might have a losing trade on that. So my goal, ladies and gentlemen, is I would be looking at four or five charts like this, and I would have positions in all of them. Um, some I'm going to get stopped out almost immediately. So in other words, you're losers, you tend to get kicked out first, which is painful in the beginning. So you've got seven positions open and then like three of them close out as losing trades and then the rest go on and make profit. But then you've got now, if you can, if you're going to have a maximum of say five positions open in that case, then I can, I've now got room to go look for two others to add to that. If that's going to be my, my portfolio. Um, and I really like doing this on the weekly, but I am showing this kind of strategy on the daily. And so I usually wait five days before I update my stop loss with maybe the exception. If I get a really massive candle that does a really big move, um, almost immediately, if that's the case, I'll update my stop loss. So what I mean is if there's an exceptional, uh, very aggressive move that's unusual, so bigger than this, actually, if I saw something happen in the markets and there was a massive candle to the upside, that for me, the markets often have to correct after that and I'm going to give back some of that profit. So if it's a really big move and I'm suddenly up a huge amount, let's say I went 1% on every one of those positions and all five positions are triggered. So I have five different stock trades open and I wake up the next day, the market's open and it's just boomed and I'm up something ridiculous like 14, 15% in a day across five positions. So each one is up one or 2%, but cumulatively it's up a lot as an example. I'm usually just like, okay, that's a, and usually big move if they whereas if they just steadily kind of go quarter of a half a percent per day then i will wait five days before i update that stop loss so uh yep yeah, so not adjusting my stop loss for five days and i do all, almost always consider taking some profits at one to one which means that once it is traveled the same distance from my entry to my stop loss up, I usually consider taking half the profit off the table. The reason I do this is that it reduces the number of full losing trades by like half. Basically, by doing that, I get a couple of break even trades, a couple of losers, and then the rest are, are profitable ones. And I also don't take it. I mean, I don't take it personally. In this case here, for example, uh, this setup here would have been a losing trade and then subsequently would have offered a really nice winning trade. So sometimes you do get a false start. You, you're not you're not wrong about the direction of the market. You just, it triggers and then it stumbles and then it and stops you out. And it, it feels like you got dumped. It feels like you got rejected by someone. Um, but the goal there is really to, uh, to see if there's another setup. And that really does sometimes happen. So, and again, that approach would be for, for you know, several months at a time. Okay, so what's the definition of one red correction day? So usually it would be if price here has, has had a nice little close to the downside. Basically, I'm wanting price to come back towards the moving averages. I'm looking, my goal is to try to join a trend from the moving averages or close geography to proximity wise to the moving averages. Because this is what this really is, is kind of the true value of it kind of again remember i was talking about buffett saying that the market overvalues it basically the market is constantly doing this around kind of a true value because it doesn't it, it like keep people getting in and out for various reasons what i've done is we've put a moving average over here because we want to get in here okay so what i'm looking for are parts where the market is coming back a little bit coming back a little bit and that's really your frame of reference the 20 moving average is a great frame of reference if you can get in an entry is if you can get a nice little bullish candle in an uptrend near the moving averages near the 10 or 20 sorry near the 20 that's a great entry location that's a it's a that's your goal is to get in close to the 20 moving average and ideally that's where you're going to get a nice little bullish candle so in other words price will go away it'll correct here you can see sorry if i just wipe this out yeah, you can see there are a couple of, you know, I like that qualifies, but visually the problem is it's not enough of a correction. I want a, an actual correction. That's more of a consolidation. Even here, it's going up and then correcting down. It's not ideal. I mean, it's still, there is a bullish candle and it does keep going. Sorry. And it does keep going, but these are, these are the ones I prefer. I prefer ones where you can see there's an actual one or two day correction, or at least a steeper correction, even in this case. Um, it comes back towards the moving average. So basically, that's my frame of reference. If that's price and that's a moving average, ideally, I'm looking for a couple of red candles that price brings it back halfway or most of the way back towards the moving average because that is where it's, you know, that's ideally when it, I'm going to join that trend. So remember that 
breathing in and out and the moving average is really the guide as to where I'm looking to get in. And sometimes the market's so bullish, it does a little bit of a correction, carries on a little bit of a correction. And sometimes that's going to have to be the case. And that distance to the moving average is going to be my frame of reference. You, and I take some profit off at one to one. And ideally, if it's three to one or four to one, when I get out, that's really good. The market offers lots of one to ones. It offers um, very few four to ones or five to ones. So in other words, expectation is important to understand that the market um, will only offer a couple of those. This is also just talking about, you know, if the weekly, for example, if you're looking at the weekly charts and you have that really nice cycle and then price breaks down below that low, or even on the daily price suddenly drops sharply and breaks that, that's usually an indication that the higher up time frame is doing its own correction because every time frame goes through a pull, uh, you know, extension, pullback, extension, pullback. And so if this is happening on the daily, then this is probably happening on the weekly. And, by, and again, if this is happening on the weekly, if it breaks that, then this is probably happening on the monthly. So don't take it to heart. You just go look at the monthly and go, oh, okay, yeah, the monthly has finally had a correction because every time frame is going to have to do that. And again, also horizontal levels. So these are kind of where price levels react. I always find that if, if, if a stock has a prior history and I can see these previous levels, if that's the case, and price is pulling back and sitting on one of those levels, and it gives that nice little bullish candle. That's just a really, really nice added bonus of support because basically price often breaks through a level, comes back, tests it, and carries on. Um, or it doesn't even do it on a horizontal level. It comes back to a previous high. So uh, this is something that can often happen. It'll go there and then pull back and then come back to this previous high here and carry on. Those are, can be fantastic little added bonuses. It's a, such a simple idea, and it, but it happens and it's very reliable in its own way. Um, so I was going to say very quickly, you can find me on, I would recommend if you can subscribe on YouTube and you can see a lot of live trades and more analysis. And if there's some, if it's allowed, I'll post the recording of this up there. If I, if I, if that's okay, that'll be, it'll be accessed there as well. You'll get it. Uh, and otherwise I'm going to kind of leave you on this slide. Now I know that there was a request for the next week. I'll go into more detail on the strategy. Um, and add a few more items because there's there's so much again you can see how how much we can add and talk about this um i wanted to find the chats let me bring up the chat so i can see all the questions and i really yeah, only Adam, uh, yeah in fact uh, regarding the book the list of the books yeah. i reminded everyone to the recordings okay so i want to remind the i take the opportunity to remind everyone listening that there will be recordings of all the four parts of the webinars we are uh, having these evenings. And therefore, no worries about uh, okay. listening okay. to it again or having to make uh, any list in the chats. I hope I have answered all the questions when you were talking. So unless <laughs> you received uh, something privately. No, no, no. Then maybe the, you want to revise those ones. Okay. Yeah, no, there was the, so, um, uh, yeah, there was the, the mention of Mark Douglas has a professional trader video series that I, I didn't mention. That was good. Are the noteworthy candles more accurate on certain timeframes? Um, generally, the higher up the time frame, the more they have, the more weights they carry because the longer they took to form. Um, but basically, no, the general rule is they're the same on, on each one. But if you get, you know, and the idea is if you get a strong bullish candle on the one minute, the market might drop it. If But you get a strong bullish candle on the monthly, it's, it's unusual that the market will not pay attention to it. So the higher up you go, the stronger it is. But we use it, we apply it equally on all. And then there was what about margin? So the, the, again here, if we keep our percentage per position low, the margin then becomes less of a factor. So the margin is kind of implied that um, the goal is not to overexpose ourselves at all in any one position. We can accumulate over time, but we really want to start small. So the reason we do this, the whole reason we use margin and leverage trading is to be able to get access to the markets. Um, but the way we do that is obviously there's more money in the account that we'll actually use. But the reason we do this is because we're leaning on the margin and leverage to help us gain those positions. Um, so it's it's a it's it's like buying a property, putting down the deposit, um, and the bank puts up the rest instead of paying cash, you know, for the property because not all of us have the cash to do that. That's the logic behind it. Um, yeah. So Simon and Antonio, I'm afraid I need to. If it's okay with you, I need um, to excuse you. Oh, I know you've you've got a uh, busy evening today yeah. so it's good to Amazing. have you thank you for joining us um good. i hope you i hope you enjoyed it i really do i hope you found some value from this and again don't forget we're carrying on with it next week so Let well me done take, adam well done take, take my, the the screen back if i if i may um antonio to yep. my screen yeah 
Um, and we'll, we'll let Adam log out. Thank you. Um, Again, thank you, gentlemen. I will um, catch up with you afterwards. I just, uh, it was an, uh, thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. And I apologize I didn't get to the platform uh, today. No, we'll have to no do that worries. next time. Thank you, Adam. All right. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Ciao. Here we go. Good. I think that's it. So thanks, Adam Harris. He's talked us through all the uh, search trading strategies and some technical analysis there as well. You can see that Adam's talking about once you get the fundamentals right, you can use the charts, the technical analysis, some of these strategies to time your your buying. Um, people debate this if the if the fundamentals are right. Some people will say doesn't matter if you're going in for the long term, medium term, even the noise, the daily ups and downs. Uh, doesn't matter. Some people that's that's where they make the money. So. It's it's entirely up to you what kind of uh, strategies will work for you, and uh, but it always helps if you can see the fundamentals and understand that you're in a good stock. It's not going to crash through the floor, uh, or at least you hope not. Um, one day by surprise. Before we go, um, because we are just about at our um, time limit, I'm going to put the link in the chat box, which I've done already, because we'd love you to open an account with Finneco Bank if you're not already a customer. I really recommend it. You just open this account, it doesn't cost you a penny, um, and you will be able to access all the tools that we've talked about, some of the platform analysis tools, the stock screen screener tool. Um, I've got a few bullet points by them on my slide at the moment. All these things are accessible to you. Not only that, you will get, if you open an account using that link, you can access to the, the offer for free trades for 100 trades or months whatever is, is is the least and uh that won't cost you a thing the, the trading costs are fairly low with Fineco, um very competitive already but in fact for this offer you can come in you don't have to pay any trading charges at all um and this is for us stocks uk stocks european stocks so so you can go in you can play you can analyze the stairs look at the stock screener tool and build a portfolio buy just, just a few if, if that's what it takes, just to just to understand how it all works and how simple it is. Um, the start screen is tool, screener tool. Um, as I say, it's all included with the account. You go into the shares tab on your, your browser. Once you log in, you'll see all the the uh, the elements there, all the different assets, classes. Um, it gives you all that information. Adam touched on it. Lots of indicators. Uh, you can even sort through the companies by their technical indicators. I know this is a fundamental night, but uh, that is very useful to, to, to find out and sift through all the companies that are trending high over, over a shorter period of time. This is what it looked like on the screen when you open up your browser and your account. Um, you'll see these uh, different things. You can click along and back and forward here through all the different uh, tools. And this is just a selection of the different types of filters. Uh, and screens that you can give. Th these titles have been uh, given to these uh, filters um, by Fineco. And you can see Warren Buffett, so that goes through a lot of what Adam was talking about, his sort of style of investing, looking for uh, undervalued uh, stocks. Uh, COVID-19 defense, potential, planets, blue gold, media entertainment, uh, contrarian stocks. Again, uh, Adam was, was talking about that growth in value, as we described earlier in the webinar tonight. Uh, and high dividend, small caps so or small capitalization, uh, but paying a high uh, dividend cash reward to reward people that take uh, that uh, position in the, the, the smaller company. Um, growing stars for growth investment, uh, all sorts of great fun stuff. So open up the account, use that link, and go and have a play about. Um, and when we see you again, hopefully in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to uh, give us some feedback. How are you getting on? We can answer any more questions. So. Uh, for Neckle Bank, uh, just to reiterate, the offer is a three month free trading offer. Um, it's available today, three months stock trading or the first 100 trades, whatever comes first. No deposit required, uh, gives you access to all the multi currency accounts, the Paradise platform, and so forth. Uh, it is open to UK only, and we have to stress that. We always get people asking. Um, to open an account, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, not going to be uh, open 
be using that link. You would need to go back to the uh, the Italian um, website. Have your valid ID, tax number, mobile phone. It's as simple as that. When I was my account up, it was all done within, I think it was over 48 hours from start to finish. So it's very simple to do that. So great. So that's us at the end of the webinar. Thank you for attending. Don't forget, we've got uh, the last session of this series on the 7th of July, and that is going to be looking more at uh, risk control and money management um, settings and, and also recapping. Adam will go back and recap a lot of this. Uh, but uh, we do thank you for attending. We hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned something new and uh, welcome any feedback, of course, um, that you can provide us. And um, with you all the best with your investing. Antonio. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. Hope uh, everyone did uh, as well. Uh, Adam uh, really went through a lot of uh, uh, new material according to the approach of the webinar we have designed at the beginning a few months ago. So I'm really happy and uh, yeah. Uh, we'll meet uh, everyone again uh, next time at the next uh, uh, session. I just want to remind uh, the promo, 100 free trades on all the stock market and the bond markets available on the platform. Everything is, uh, yeah, 100 free trades for three months or uh, uh, since the account has been opening, has been opened. And uh, I agree with you, Simon, the account is free, so anyone can just open it and try all the features and uh, see all the data and news uh, available. And uh, once they got used to it, they can start trading uh, free of charge for the first three months and, and give it a shot. So thank you again for uh, this special evening and um, uh, catch up soon on the 7th of July. We will do. Take care there in Milan and uh, thanks everybody, whatever you are, take care. We'll see you again next time. Thank you so much. Bye.